good to see y'all. Welcome back. Thank you. I'm glad to be back. I had such a positive experience here last year for those of you guys that weren't here. Um, it was a really exciting time. I'm glad to be back in Cincinnati. I've got some love for the city now. Chris Moore's making me a fan. Um, just to give you a little background on myself, I founded um, a couple of wedding websites. I have no clue how I ended up in the wedding space. I'm not engaged. I'm not married. And it was like a black cat on my love life. But other than that, it was a great experience. Um, I started my first firm, or my first company in DC, and then we went through the 500 Startups Accelerator program in, uh, in Mountain View. And then I started, um, we started raising our first round. We were doing well. And I was working actually with a PR firm to help do branding, get distribution, marketing, all that good stuff. Um, stayed on with Tailored for about a year and a half, and I was getting really frustrated with the whole process of PR. I don't think that traditional PR works for startups. I think that it can be a tad gimmicky, um, and I just thought I could do it better. So I decided I was gonna start my own PR firm for startups, and everybody told me not to because there's no money in startups. <laughs> Um, but actually, I have been loving it. I really am passionate about it, and I'm excited to be here. If I talk too fast, I apologize. You can just tell me to slow down. I have a tendency to do that. Um, but basically, I just want to give you all, that's supposed to say eight, shortcuts to quickly um, gaining brand credibility and distribution. If there's one thing that you guys can take away from this, um, from this presentation, I really want you guys to remember how important I don't know what that is. <laughs> um, <laughs> how important it is to find your voice. A lot of startups come to me and they're like, I want to be on the front page of CNN. I want to be on the cover of Forbes. I want to be out there and then my company is going to take off. And a lot of times they don't even understand their voice and really what their brand's all about. Um, Aaron Walter did a, it has an excerpt from his book, Designing for Emotion, and it's all about creating a design persona. So what this does, this activity, I would totally recommend Googling it and doing it with your team. It helps identify where the disconnect is between your designers and developers and your marketing and PR people. So I have never developed a day in my life. I've never designed a day in my life. And I was trying to explain to three men how they should feel in a woman's shoes who's about ready to get married. Um, they looked at me with blank stares. No one really had an understanding. We were having a total disconnect. So we sat down, the three of us, and actually originally did this exercise individually and then came together. Um, even my business development-based co-founder and I had very different ideas about who we were as a company and what our voice was. And this helped us really understand who we were. Um, they, the case study that they do or that Aaron Walter uses in this exercise is MailChimp. And you guys all know, obviously, what MailChimp does. And how many of you guys would recognize the MailChimp monkey if you saw it? OK. You realize that people are obsessed with the monkey, and this is an e-marketing company. People are excited about the monkey and about the voice behind the monkey and about the brand. They wear hats with MailChimp on them. They get all excited when they see a big billboard in a city. They start tweeting about it. They've built this brand, and they've really determined a strong voice. Before you do any PR or marketing, it's really important that everyone in your company understands who you are. And this exercise has, to be honest with you, turned a lot of my clients' companies around. I've had people email me and call me afterward and say, I had no idea how clueless we were about who we were or that we all thought we were on the same page and actually we were using different voices in social media than we were in our web copy, than we were in our e-marketing. So this is just a quick exercise to help you guys go through it. Um, you can always email me at sarah, S-A-R-A, at 1111pr.co if you want me to just send you the link or tell you a little bit more about it. But I really do think that it's, um, it's pretty life-changing. The second thing I want you all to think about before we even get into press placements is how to pimp out your partnerships. So I came on with a client called Kona Case, and they'd started doing a partnership with Kind Bars. Um, Kind Bars is, you can buy them in Starbucks, you can buy them in the grocery store. They have a huge presence on social media, and Kona Case was really excited. This is a um, monthly subscription box with nutrition products to be partnering with Kind. I was like, this is badass. I just come on with the company. I was like, this is so cool. So how are you leveraging their brand? And they're like, what do you mean? We've got their stuff in our boxes. Like, that's the partnership. Um, their social network and their press contacts are far more extensive than Kona cases. And I said to them, every business, I want you guys to think about every business development partnership that you have, 
should have some sort of PR and social media component around it. I don't care what the partnership is. I don't care if you guys are doing co-branded e-marketing. Make sure you're supporting it via social media. Make sure you are doing some blogging together. So maybe you have the founder of their company writing on your blog. Um, you're blogging on theirs. It's all about leveraging each other's network. Because yeah, it's great to say to your people that you're featuring Kind Bars in your Kona case this month. Or maybe it's great to say to your network, yeah, we're partnering with Nike. But it's far more valuable to have them talking about your brand and to a community that may not know you um, than for you to be talking to the same people that obviously are already following you on social media and already understand who you are. Once we did this, um, the partnership lasted 30 days. Their sales went up 28% in 30 days. What I had them do was create a, a list between all of the people in their company, divided it up saying, once we build a partnership, once we get a partnership, this is each person's individual role. Um, because we started doing tweets, contests, giveaways around this partnership, it was far more successful and they were able, able to leverage the brand. They were also able to work with Kind, who had these exceptional press contacts in Runner's World and all these other magazines that this company didn't have to say, hey, listen, we'll write some content for you all. Can you help us pitch this co-branded partnership to these editors? And Kind was really receptive to it. You know, at some point, these big companies have kind of exhausted all of their editorial options. So it's helpful for them to have new ideas with new content coming out. If you can go to a bigger partner and say, we're small, we're mobile, we can think of really creative, cool, viral marketing ideas to push to the press, they'll connect you with their contacts. Um, the founders of Kona Case bought red unitards <laughs> with full masks. It was the scariest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. But they got on bikes and started passing out these Kona Cases with the Kind Bars, saying they were doing random acts of kindness. And they pitched it to Kind, and Kind is going to be doing a big push via social media in June when they have the co-branded boxes. So you never know what they'll pick up. Probably no one at Kind would be like, you know what, I'm going to go online and buy a huge red spandex unitard and bike around in it. But you're, you know, your startups, you can do weird stuff and honestly leverage that because it'll get you good press and it'll get people to like you personally and they'll be more, they'll be more apt to work with you. So pimp out your partnerships. Number three, um, being an industry ex expert. I give, and my clients hate this, but I don't care. <laughs> I give them homework assignments and ask them to create a minimum of one post a week. What I do is before you put anything live on your blog, um, and hopefully, how many of y'all have blogs, by the way? Okay, good, everyone should be raising their hands. I don't care if you feel like you have nothing to say, trust me, you do, and you'll start building a community around it. And I know that developers and designers a lot of times don't wanna get into the writing world, but you could give idiots like me who know nothing about development and design so much to learn. You know, I have so much to learn, you could teach me so much, so you really do have a lot to offer. Um, I have them create one piece a week. If you need to get a really savvy journalism intern, do it. And start writing about things in your field, okay? I don't, if you're in the design field, start writing about design trends that you're seeing. If you're in the fashion field, same with fashion. Um, you, it can really be about anything. It can be about a personal issue that you're having at work. Um, before you put it live on your blog, get it to someone who would potentially want content on their blog that's bigger than you or their website that's bigger than you. The reason why I say this is a lot of the mid-range bloggers and editors don't have enough time to be constantly churning out editorial, um, print's dying, it's hard for them to get good content without having to pay people money, and they're cutting reporters, and they need freelance contributors. That's how I ended up, um, my, my case study is, is with CNN, but that's how I ended up becoming a regular blogger for Huffington Post. I just kept emailing them my stories, to the point where I was probably the most annoying person they've ever heard from. And finally she's like, all right, all right, we'll print one. And once you can get your foot in the door and get one post out there, you'll start building this relationship, and I guarantee you could become a contributor in a publication you probably wouldn't have thought you could reach. Um, another case study with becoming an industry expert. .co had me go to South by Southwest for them, so the .co platform. And I was like, you know what? I had no one that was going to pick up this piece. And I said, I'm going to write a piece, and I'll give it to you on your blog. I'll write all about what I think the trends are for South by Southwest 2013. But before I give it to you, I'm going to try and get you better press by pitching it to other people. And I said, this is my story. These are my thoughts on South by Southwest. And I had multiple people write back, and it ended up getting picked up by CNN Headline News. Because they don't have the money to send people everywhere. If you can be, your first writing assignment could be about QC Merge. Talk about the Cincinnati startup scene and see what you can do in terms of getting it to a blogger in New York or LA who doesn't have people on the ground in your community. You could really become an active voice for Cincinnati and for the tech startup world here. Um, before I keep going, do you guys have any questions? Okay. 
Cool. This one I love. Um, flattery will get you everywhere, and it's so true. So people love to talk about themselves. They love to get awarded stuff, even if the award doesn't mean anything necessarily. Um, we had, my first wedding startup was Wedzilla, and it was basically facilitating the relationship between brides and vendors. And we had a ton of bloggers that we worked with. And what we did was we said to these bloggers, hey, listen, we're gonna give you this nifty badge, and the badge is gonna say that you're a top 25 Wedzilla blogger. And it's just gonna link back to your profile on our blog. Well, now we had 25 more inbound links because everybody put that badge up on their blog. Maybe you've got a blog about the design community and you want to give it to your 10 favorite designers. Maybe they're in this room and so now they know what they're falling for. Um, but it's really helpful to, and, and you know, obviously there should be some meat behind it. So we really did enjoy and, and like these bloggers. But getting, it was actually more helpful for us, getting that um, badge out there that linked back to our site and getting those profiles made them want to contribute more content. So now we went from having two to three posts a day on our blog to eight to 10. Um, it got us more SEO inbound links, and then it gave the bloggers some credibility. They felt like they were being honored for being a really great contributor, and it made them want to support our brand more. So there's a lot there that you can gain from doing awards and recognizing people in your industry. Um, also, if you were to write a post, let's say this was one of the things you were gonna get out there um, for one of your blog posts, which is someone, let's see here, I'll pick um, you in a blue and white striped shirt. What does your company do? You, oh, okay, well, I know what Kroger does. <laughs> so, okay, so let's say you wanted to do a blog post on 10, um, a blog post on 10 brands that were your favorite brands out there. And you don't even need the microphone for this. I won't, I won't quiz you too hard. But the best thing you could do, working for Kroger, obviously, they have some brand affinity, so I didn't exactly pick a small company. But um, if you were to write a blog post on your 10 featured nutritional products that Kroger, Kro that Kroger has in their store, what you would do after writing this post and putting it live on the Kroger blog is you would email or tweet every single person that was, every single company or person that was featured in that post, and they're gonna be more likely to share it with their networks. So now in addition to having it shared with your community, every, because flattery will get you everywhere, everyone else is gonna wanna be like, hey, I was just featured by Kroger as a top 10 brand, and now you have these huge companies that are sharing this post and helping you extend your network. Um, I did this, the, the case study here with Huffington Post. One of my clients is an iPhone app, um, a wedding iPhone app. And I conveniently wrote a post for the Huffington Post about the top five iPhone apps for weddings. And conveniently, my client was in the list. Um, but there were four other spots. And when I started to go through and review the iPhone apps, I was looking for really great apps, and so I narrowed it down to like 10, and then picked the other four strategically, this is like opening up my closet of secrets, um, based on their social networks and based on their reach. And then I messaged every single person that was in that piece and said, hey, guess what? You're in the Huffington Post today. Can you share it with your networks? So now it went from sharing you know, with 10,000 people on Twitter to having um, photocracy that has 100,000 followers on Twitter sharing it and 150,000. So in addition to getting it through the Huffington Post network, then getting it shared on our network, the other four companies that were featured on these, uh, in this piece shared it with theirs too. So anytime you can give a shout out to people and let people know that you love their company, you love what they're doing, and then gently email them and say, hey, listen, I featured you. I would love it if you shared this piece with, their net with your network. Nine out, of time, nine out of 10 times they'll say yes. And it's a really great way to start relationship building and to start growing your reach. Uh, make sure they're tagging you too, obviously. So, um, nep oh, okay, I obviously didn't save that. Oh no, five and I think we have the wrong version of this, but that's okay, I'll just keep going. So never say no to coverage. Um, this is actually one of the questions I get a lot, which is we get asked to be covered in particular blogs or in particular websites, and they only have 570 followers. Um, the, you know, should we even bother? I get that question a lot. And my answer is always yes. Um, number one, because you never know who's gonna grow. And I'm sorry, y'all, that it's, um, I have the wrong version on here, um, but okay, I'll just keep talking. So number one, because you never know who's gonna grow. Um, but number two, because if you start to really reach out to people, like, and you could do it in a two paragraph thing with, you have somebody write your bio, write your company storyline, 
and then write five or six talking points about your company with a few quotes, you can easily have something that you can tweak that'll take three minutes to tweak um, that you send out to these people. So instead of saying, yeah, of course, we've got, a th we've got 30 minutes for a phone interview, let them know we really appreciate the coverage. Um, we definitely want to get something over to you. Let me go ahead and email you some, you know, can you email me some answers to the questions? I am really of the philosophy that you never know who you're going to meet and how big they're going to grow and who they may be able to connect you with. So I would always say never say no to coverage. Um, people have different views on this and obviously you know there's this 2080 rule and you don't want to be spending time doing things that isn't going to really grow your community. But I genuinely believe that there's no publication too small um, that isn't worth sharing your, your company with. Um, okay, number seven. Uh-oh, Chris is not. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, y'all. Um, does anyone have any questions about that, or have you run into that where you feel like you're spending a lot of time working with really small publications? No? Okay. Does anyone have any questions at all while we break to do this? Yes? Okay, so the 2080 rule is a lot of entrepreneurs spend 80. Perfect, thank you. Um, a lot, awesome, much better. Okay, so this was what that pretty little slide was supposed to look like. So um, I'll answer your 2080 question first. Uh, a lot of people say that entrepreneurs spend 80% of their time working on stuff that's only getting them 20% of the result, and that you should be focused on being really efficient and lean and spending 20% on your time on stuff that's going to do 8% of the results. It should be flipped. So a lot of people say, well, I don't want to reach out to someone that has 500 followers on Twitter because it's taking too much of my time. But having a worksheet, if you have any good PR person, you're working with a marketing person, the first thing they should ask you is, T give me your bio, let's work on a really good company profile, and anytime someone reaches out to you that's a small publication, have them handle it. It should be really quick, really fast, really easy. So my main thing on that is always say yes, always be friendly. You never know what's going to happen with them. Um, case in point, Brit. Brit.co is now a multi-million dollar company. She's on the Today Show all the time. Brit Morin, um, she's the wife of the founder of Path. She's absolutely incredible, exceptionally creative, and she met with me when I was first starting Tailored. And to be honest with you, when I was sitting there meeting with her, I was thinking, why is she meeting with me? Because she is so much um, bigger than me. And she started. She did a couple of blog posts for Tailored while we were working together, and she was the one that said to me, I've genuinely gotten where I am now um, because I never said no. I always met with people. I always gave people my time. And now as other people grow alongside her, she's an industry favorite. So. Um, did you have a question as well? I didn't want to over, overlook you. Um, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> I'm going to get one of these. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Uh, how about flipping the question in the sense that the company that I work for, we're very small, but we're growing exponentially. Mm -hmm. And we service the culinary industry. Mm -hmm. And so we have two products. One is a do-it-yourself, and then the other product are pre-made silicone molds. And so we have partners that are from Food Network. They've, they're well known within the industry. So my challenge is getting up to where we can actually start talking to um, personalities like the Martha Stewart's. Although the company, the owner of the company has been on her show, how do we get to that level, to the Today Show, the Good Morning Show? when we're still under the radar? Okay, that's a really, really great question. Um, I get that all the time, and I especially get it with clients that say that the first thing they wanna do, I ask them to put together a wish, a wish list, which is, you know, where would you wanna be if you could be anywhere? And they wanna jump right to that. The best thing I could say to you is lily pad. Um, I remember after, and I'll give you an example of this, but I remember after starting with Wedzilla, I was talking to people that my co-founder kept saying, you're having conversations with people you have no business talking to. And it was true. I was meeting with the editor-in-chief of Brides Magazine when we hadn't even launched our website yet. We were a wedding website and hadn't even launched. Um, the way that we started to do that is, you'll find in a lot of industries, like we were sitting in the green room and I was talking and, and we found out that we had, you know, a couple of the other founders and I had common friends from Silicon Valley. It's such a small world. Um, that's why I say never say no to people that are smaller. But I guess my general advice would be, if you become an industry expert and you start to build really good content, people will notice it. Start with the middle tiered blogs. Um, by middle tiered blogs, I mean people that, you know, they may be quasi popular, but they're not the CNN or Forbes of the world. Once you can get a few of those under your belt, it becomes, becomes much easier to get the big guns. I would also say start every email to an editor with a story idea. This is my name. This is the company that I do. I've seen your other coverage, so make sure you've been following what else they've been covering. 
and I have an idea for you. I got networked into CNN um, because of a story that they'd written that I said, I want to do an op-ed for it. I liked what you did. I've got a totally different perspective. Editors pay attention to that. You'd be surprised. Um, I have gotten so many responses from people that I would think would be really unreachable. Once you get a couple of press hits under your belt, it becomes so much more, it becomes much easier to access those people. Um, also, if you have anyone that's ever been placed before in a good publication, now would probably be the time to say, hey, I really loved your piece on that. Would you mind introing me to the editor? I have a, a similar story idea. Um, people can be guarded with their press contacts, but I think that's the idea of kind of doing to others as you do unto you. You know, if you're nice to other people and you really kind of let them know that you're in a similar position, they'll be helpful. Um, but I'd start with middle tier blogs. I'm trying to give some good examples, but like Silicon Angle is a tech publication. It's not huge. Um, tech Cocktail in DC, it's not, you know, it's not Tech Crunch, but it's a great publication and it's a little bit more middle tiered. And once you get a couple of those under your belt, it'll be much easier to get the Tech Crunch, the Mashable, the CNN, and the Forbes. Okay, founders, this is also gonna help you get on um, onto some of the bigger ones. Founders facing forward. So I feel like a lot of times, and you guys should really maybe take a look at your companies this way, people don't understand the personality behind the brand or the people behind the brand. Um, I don't care how you know unemotional of a product you're producing or your website is, people wanna know um, the individuals behind the company. So I don't wanna see any emails coming from info at or, you know, oh, this is coming to you from 1111 headquarters. It's like, A, that's really lame, because what am I like, NASA? But, you know, I mean, I don't even know what that means. But the second thing I would say is, um, every time I write an email, it comes directly from me. And I think a lot of startup people think that you need to appear bigger than you are, and you need to kind of be like, oh, and we over here at team blah, 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 are doing this, that, and the other. Um, it's funny, I think people appreciate knowing that you're a small company and wanna support small business. So I would really make sure when you're reaching out to press, say, hey, I'm da-da-da, I'm the founder. Once I was at, when I was at Tailored reaching out to press, I got responses from people just by saying, I'm the founder, I'm seriously passionate about what I do, and I'm gonna keep emailing you every week until you respond. And I did. I set iCal events um, every week. And one of the press contacts, contacts that I finally got on the phone said, you know the thing about you, Sarah, is I can throw you out the door, but you're going to come back in the window. And I took that as the highest compliment. I was like, hell yeah, I'm annoying. Um, because I wanted to stay on their radar. And it's been great for my clients, but it's actually harder for me to email as a PR person than it was as a founder. I find more pushback. So I would say, even if you do have a PR team and maybe they're having a hard time reaching out to some contacts, don't ever feel like you shouldn't be as a founder reaching out. Um, ask them what they've got on their editorial calendar. That's a really big thing. Um, facing forward and saying, listen, I have some ideas. I'm a founder in this space. I have some ideas on this topic that you've been covering. What does your editorial calendar look like? Can I send a few pieces I've already written over to you? Nine times out of 10, they'll say yes. Um, the, case, the case study for Facebook Half United. Half United is one of my clients. Uh, the reason why I bring them up is I haven't had to touch their social media. They are genius. They share stuff that I'm like, who actually cares about this? Um, but inside the Half United office, they talk about what they're doing in the community. They talk about what they're having for lunch. They show behind the scenes of their interviews. They talk about squabbles that they have in the office. They show themselves actually making the product and people love it. Um, it shows that they're a really small company. That's the thing, right? So they're giving an inside look at a four person company. So they're not looking like big wigs, but everybody loves them and feels so attached to their brand because you know Carmen and Christian and everyone associates those two people with the brand. So I think the biggest mistake um, that a lot of startups can make is feeling like you have to be the company and you can't be yourself. And a lot of times that can alienate your user or it can alienate the press. You know, the press may think you have a great product, but if they don't feel attached to your company, they may not want to feature you. Um, building a loyal community. So MailChimp, one of the things I actually heard the founder of MailChimp speak, and one of the things that he said to me was that he was asked one day, what was the return on investment for handing out MailChimp monkey hats and t-shirts? Someone wanted to know what the tangible analytics of handing those out were. And they raised their hand and he looked at them and he goes, exact words, pardon my French for the video, I have no fucking clue, was what he said. I have no fucking clue. He's like, that is so intangible and you should be doing things that are completely intangible. Once a week, reach out to your users, pick 10 random ones, and say, hey, 
it's me, the founder, I wanna talk to you, I just wanna ask what you love, what you hate, what you don't like. Um, the reason why I say to do this from a press standpoint and from a PR standpoint is, there's nothing better than having your consumers be your brand evangelist. And trust me, once they start talking about you and tagging you on Twitter, tagging you on Facebook, press will notice. Um, some of the best press polls that I've gotten have come from campaigns that my, that my clients have done or that I did in my previous startups that were actually kickstarted by some of our users. So they pay attention to what people are talking about. Um, and if you haven't built a relationship with your users, it becomes much more difficult to feel like you have a genuine community behind your brand. Uh, that, that can also be true for building relationships with other companies, just setting an iCal event and saying, I'm going to reach out to you once a week. Um, it's always easier, you know, one of the quotes that I was, I have a very bad time delegating, um, but my co-founder told me um, of my previous company, it's always better to have 1% of 100 people's efforts than 100% of your own. And it's okay to let go sometimes. So maybe if it's not you reaching out to your consumers, maybe it's you have one intern that's all customer service based, um, that's answering every question that comes on Twitter, that's responding to different editorials from different um, different publications and saying, hey, listen, I just saw you know this article on crowdsourcing. We're doing something really similar here. That is reaching out and being a part of an active community is so important. And I know that you guys understand that because you're here. And if you didn't understand that, you wouldn't be here. And I think that's really cool. Um, before I keep going, does anyone have any questions? No? Okay. The next um, piece of advice I would give is random acts of kindness. So sharing is caring. Take a li make a list of 10 target partnerships uh, with people that are bigger than you, that have a larger following than you, that you love their products, that you'd want to work with. Do the same thing with publications, 10 of each. So 10 partners, 10 publications. And start to reach out to them on a personal level. Whenever a business partner that you potentially would want to work with does something cool, retweet it, write the founder an email, it doesn't matter if you hear back. Say, hey, I loved what you did. Don't even bring up working together. Do it two or three times. Um, and then by the fourth time, say, hey, I've been, as you can see, over the past couple of months, I've been watching what you've been doing, and we'd love to start working with you. That's how a lot of our really great partnerships um, worked, and leveraging those huge partnerships makes it easier to get press. Same thing with publications. Pick five or ten of your favorite publications, um, from middle tier ones to really large kind of shoot for the, st the stars um, publications, and start writing and following, or start writing to and following writers you really respect. Um, I would say reach out to them on Twitter, shoot them an email. It may take a while for them to respond. Ask them insightful questions. I had a couple of different editors after I'd asked some questions about pieces they'd written, reach out to me for follow-up stories and say, hey, I remember you asked me a question on this. I'm actually writing a follow-up story and I'd really love your opinion. Um, this also kind of comes back to the intangible part of connecting with people in your community. You may not get immediate results, but trust me, people will take notice. Um, also, don't only come to someone when you need something. That is a lesson I think that's really hard to learn because we're all so busy and we have our heads down and we're startups and that's what we do is we keep our heads down, we keep focused, and then all of a sudden, oh God, we've got a problem, we need some help, let's reach out to this person. I do this sometimes too, everyone can be guilty of it, but I would say the same thing about setting an iCal event. If you have a really good conversation with someone or you meet someone at QC Merge, this is a good example, Take five individuals from QC Merge, like make this be your first outreach assignment that you feel like you really forged a bond with or felt like you had some really genuine conversation and set an iCal event three weeks from now to follow up with an email and just ask them how they're doing. And the responses you get will be so wonderful. Some of the best relationships that I have now in the industry came from people that were way better at doing that than I did, than I was, and they would email me and just say, hey, I saw you started your PR firm, how's it going? And I was waiting for the next line in the sentence, like, I really need help with a press release, can you help me? And it didn't come. And it was just a nice outreach. And now, if they ever needed anything, I would feel like I would drop anything to help them. Um, a little bit of random act of kindness there, but um, yeah, set your iCal uh, reminders. Another case study is Silicon Angle. So they're a publication, I brought them up once before in Silicon uh, Valley, based in Mountain View, actually, and Kristen Nicole is one of the reporters for them. She's very well connected. And she wrote one piece on us about a year ago. And I set an iCal reminder every three weeks, to email her and just say, how are you? Saw your recent piece, really cool. Hope everything's going great. Then when I launched my new PR firm, I was able to come to her because we'd kept this really open dialogue and say, hey, guess what? It's me. I could really use your help. I need to get the word out. And she immediately said yes. 
And I don't want it to sound like it's one of those things where you're only doing it because you eventually may need something. Um, I want you to do it because you should be connecting with people in your industry and in your space anyway. But the benefit is that you're not then going six months without contacting them and then needing something at the end. Editors really, really appreciate that. Um, and that's how I've forged a lot of really great relationships in the press. So, in exactly 30 minutes, so I do have some time for some Q&A. But I, I guess all in all, what I would say is it can seem really overwhelming to try and get press and to get publicity. Um, but one of the things I want you all to remember is that it isn't necessarily about landing CNN or landing the Today Show. It can be about building your SEO and going from small to big and lily padding through. Um, getting yourself out there can be difficult. If you don't have someone on your team now who's a strong writer or someone who has a passion for journalism or for writing, there are so many poor postgraduate college students that would kill for an opportunity to work with a startup. I was one of them. That's how I got into this whole mess. <laughs> um, but And it was life-changing for me. I thought I was going to do broadcast journalism, and they needed help with marketing and PR at a startup, and it kind of took off from there. So I would really keep your eye open. Good writing can take you a long way um, in this community, especially if you have a lot more left brain people on your team, developers and designers. Um, but it is PR isn't the enemy. I think a lot of times people think that it's kind of a stagnant, you know, oh, you just get placed and that's all it is. It can really be about providing information for people in your space, um, really getting yourself out there as an industry expert and building connections within your field. So hopefully I've helped answer some questions. Um, I wanted to try and give you guys just a few takeaways because PR can be a very expansive subject. Um, but also make sure you go and look up the uh, design persona from Aaron Walter because it really can be life changing. I feel like the beginning of the whole journey with getting yourself out there can be finding the discrepancies on your team between what one person thinks your company is all about and what you think your company is all about and then going from there. And once you have created the design persona, you can refer back to it often. It's super helpful. Does anyone have any questions? Where'd the name of your company come from? I was, everyone thinks it's because you, people are like, oh yeah, you kiss the clock at 11-11, which I do. But I was born on the 11th day of the 11th month in 83, 8 plus 3 equals 11, weighed 7 pounds, 11 ounces, born 9-11 a.m. So 11's my lucky number. <laughs> Henceforth. <laughs> um, anyone else? Yes? Uh, I'm sorry, could you say that one more time? Sorry, there is a microphone. That's actually, if you're trying to build a brand for yourself, which is basically what I've been doing with 11.11, um, or you know, just being a content provider, it all, it all comes down to the same thing, making yourself really transparent and reaching out to connections and offering content. I would say being a content provider can be the biggest strong suit for yourself. If you write, five, if you sit down and make yourself write five posts a week about topics that interest you and you start getting them out there to publications, blogs are blogs, um, websites, editorial magazines are in, constant need of content, that would be my biggest tip to you, is start being a content provider. Um, start leveraging other brands in your post so they want to share it with your network. And just get yourself out there so that when someone has a question, you would be the person that they would go to for it, in whatever respective field you are. I hope that at some point, if you guys ever had a question about PR or creating a press release or getting yourself out there, that I could be someone that would be helpful with that. Um, what is your, what are you building your brand around? Okay. <laughs> I'm kind of like the guy from Kroger. I, I work in a larger corporation, so it's kind of, I mean, it's great talking about startups, but that's not really necessarily what I do. So. Okay, so <laughs> if you had to say, like, what, you know, when you say I want to build a brand around myself, like, you want people to know you for what? Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. So we're deciding that later on. Uh, well, whatever yeah. that thing is, you start writing about it. Sure. Writing is honestly, like, the key to it. Um, if you can, I mean, pair up with somebody that's done it before, that's been published before, and just say, how did you kind of formulate your brand and how did you start getting yourself out there? And honestly, it's really crazy. Once you get one good hit, like work your butt off for one good hit, and once you get one good press hit and you put in an email to other editors, they're like, wait a second, this magazine featured you? Well, I guess I should too. It's really amazing how much one good press pull can do for you. Um, yeah, I for a Hold on a second. <laughs> so ominous. I'm not going to run around for nothing. <laughs> of course. Um, I work with a publisher, and I was wondering if you have any 
um, places that I could go to get content providers. That's a really good. Um, I would so you're looking for people to provide content for you. Um, what are the subject matters if you don't? Um, homeschool curriculum. Uh, homeschool curriculum. Um, all kind of ed educational products. Okay, so the first thing I would do is look for. Um, bloggers that are writing on those topics. There are, God, education and homeschool, like those are just moms want to talk all day long about homeschooling their kids, what's going on with them. Um, I have a client that's in that space as well. So I would just start Googling like stay at home, you would be amazed, like stay at home kid or home homeschooling blogs yeah. and find those bloggers and say, hey, I'd love to offer you an opportunity to, to get distribution and you will get so many yeses. I'm telling you, it'll be super easy. So I would just I would just start reaching out. I would start with small time bloggers that really want to get their word out. Um, there are actually a lot, to be honest with you, I would stay away from, um, you'd be surprised, I would stay away from New York and LA markets and go more for like, Charlotte, North Carolina has a ton of education blogs that are really great um, mom blogs. Uh, some of the smaller markets, you'll be surprised, can build a really strong community around them. Um, so if you, if you can take what they've already built from their blog and bring it to you, um, that would definitely be helpful. Okay, thanks a lot. You're welcome. Now we got this. <laughs> Uh, what, what about other media, like a video, for example, like a, like a two-minute thing, or what, you know, how, uh, how do articles uh, stack up to uh, other media? So you mean in terms of outreach, like how do you get placed if you were... Uh, no, cre instead of uh, writing an article, can you just shoot like a two-minute video? Yes, um, that's a great, great question, and I didn't touch on video as much. With the way that technology has changed, so GoPro cameras, flip cams, shooting things on your iPhone, you can do really cool stuff that's really low budge that people will pick up. Um, video is super engaging, look at YouTube. I would start a YouTube channel for your company. Um, I would try and pitch out the videos before you put them on your, your YouTube and offer them as an exclusive. This viral, this video that we wanted to do to go viral um, for them wearing the red unitards and passing out these um, kind bars was really ridiculous, but it was amazing, the press response that we got from it. Uh, number one, because they have no one on staff that would ever do that in public without being more mortified. And number two, because it's so low budge, they're not spending any money on it. It's a, actually, you know, I probably should have mentioned that. It's it's a lot easier almost to get pressed with a cool viral video um, that it can be with writing a stagnant article. Uh, it can be difficult. It can be a little bit more difficult. You're going to need to make sure that they tag you so you get the SEO value. And you'll probably have to craft a little bit of content around it. But I would definitely say that it can be super easy to do. Start building a YouTube channel and then start kind of networking through Twitter and, and social media that way too. Do you have a YouTube channel? No. Okay, start one. <laughs> That's actually another thing too that he just reminded me of. Never post anything on your publication. If you think it could be newsworthy, let's say you were writing about some you know, really popular current event or a trend that you know is going crazy, give yourself 48 hours to pitch it to other people before you put it live on your blog. Once you put it live on your blog, the exclusivity kind of goes away. Um, so I would try and pitch it, have someone on your team pitch it really quickly, even if you want to shorten it to 24 hours. With this video, give yourself 24 hours to pitch it. If you don't hear back, um, no big deal, but saying the first line, we shot this really cool video, I've got an idea for it, it's super relevant, we'd love to have you publish it. If you don't respond to me, I'm going to put it live on our blog in 24 hours. And editors will be, it gives them a deadline, right? And editors work on deadlines, so they can respect that. So if you start out with saying, I'm giving you first access, even if it's the most ridiculous video you've ever done, you'd be surprised what they bite at. Um, I would say, do that first. Give them kind of an ultimatum before you put it live on your blog. Yes? Hey, when Hi. you uh, pitch something to an editor, um, do you ask them if you can, or do you pitch it so that you can post it then also on your blog at some point? Uh, like a couple days later or something like that so you get SEO value from it? Um, so basically you're just going to want to always make sure um, and this kind of comes, this is going to be another takeaway point. Look for keywords that are high searchability and low competition um, in Google and start to have them tag your blog and your website obviously but in addition have those keywords linked to you. Once they've done that, you've got the inbound links. So whether you repurpose it for your blog or you don't, it's not nearly as important. Um, I would say you can reblog it. So I would just like reshare and say, it, it's actually more valuable to say as seen on the Huffington Post and link to the Huffington Post article. Um, another reason why I say to do that as opposed to just giving it to Huffington Post and then writing the same thing on your blog um, is that 
Obviously, once it's not unique content, it's not valued as high. And also, in addition, the more people you can send to that article that are going to tweet it, Facebook share it, the Huffington Post editors check and see which stories are the most viral. Um, and based on that, they'll be more interested in reaching out to you if you've got a really strong community of people to be driven to their to their website. So yeah, just I would say, you know, as seen on Huffington Post, a link directly to them would be the best way. You're welcome. Double trouble, I don't know. <laughs> You're starting your own blog, say, to build expertise and kind of get your name out there. How narrow focus do you recommend? Like, can you just write about whatever you want? Should you narrow in on a category? So I call this the give a shit factor, is a lot of people want to, I have a really clean mouth, right? My dad would be really proud today. I've dropped an F-bomb. I've said shit. This is just wonderful. Um, when you're blogging, I would think about, and a lot of people say like, oh, I don't really, I don't really know what to write because I feel like people won't be interested. If you're writing it because you are interested in it, odds are other people will be too. Um, what I would probably do is if, what, if you don't mind me asking, what area are you in? What? Uh, marketing, advertising, content development. Okay. I would think the most popular blogs are um, blogs that either are top tens. That's another thing I would do in terms of content. People love to syndicate posts that are lists. So top 10 this, top five this. Um, start with some lists. So as an advertising agent, maybe you're going to say top 10, you know, top 10 tricks of the trade to make the best advertisement possible. Um, I would start with lists. Those are going to be more, they're, they're more easily searched and then also people tend to share them more. But also I would say in terms of your focus, that's going to come back to knowing your brand and knowing your audience. If you go through the design persona and kind of figure out who do I want to be in this space, um, before you start writing, the crafting will become a lot more of a natural process. So for example, I tend to talk about wanting to help startups grow and build their brand through certain measures. And I did a whole design persona um, for my PR firm before I got started. And now if I write a post, I can go back to my design persona and my brand voice and reference it and be like, this isn't really in line with who I want to be. So I would just make sure before you get started, that can be a tough question. You know, what do I write about? What do I not write about? And there are no real concrete rules, but the best brands um, and the best companies out there have a consistent voice throughout their content. So people know that when they're coming, no matter what you're writing about, they're getting your voice. Um, so deciding that first, I would think, is key. And then just writing about things that you're really passionate about. I don't think people should ever write about things that don't interest them. It comes through in your voice. It's really obvious. Um, also, if you've been asked a lot of questions in your experience, if you're getting the same questions over and over again from the people in your industry or from your users, those are probably hot topics you should put on your blog. Is that helpful? Yep. OK, you. you're welcome. Anyone else? I think there was someone else back there. but. Y'all are quiet right now. Everyone's in a food coma. <laughs> I got them post sandwiches. I think he's right there. We have a winner. You actually touched on this with your last answer, but um, I do software documentation work. So I'm actually I'm a professional writer, but uh, technical writing is a very different thing than um, marketing writing. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a very difficult time getting that kind of tone, the voice for marketing writing. So do you have any kind of tips on totally. how to write? Yep. Um, I have a, one of the clients I was telling you about, Kona Case. They had me go through their web copy and their e-marketing copy. And one of the and these guys are the most. They're the people that were wearing the red unitards. They're the most ridiculous out there founders I've ever worked with, and I love working with them. And their e-marketing copy and their blog posts were like, hello, users. It is wonderful to see you today. And we have five things we'd love to talk to you about. And I was like, you all sound cheesy. And I don't even like you when I read, when I read this. I, want you to, I was like, I want you to read in your voice this blog post you wrote. And they sounded ridiculous. It didn't sound like them at all. So what I made them do was I made them take a tape recorder. And instead of them writing their post, so let's say the topic that you're writing about is you want to talk about the, I don't know, like trends and like your five favorite restaurants or something. So if I were you, I would sit down before you even transcribe anything and say it into the tape recorder how you would say it to your best friend. 
and write and start talking. And you will start to notice that once you do that a few times, and obviously you don't want to then sit down and press play and like transcribe it word for word, but if there's a big discrepancy in between how you sound when you read a blog post out loud and how you sound when you say it into a tape recorder as if you were saying it to your best friend, you've lost your voice. And the most valuable thing you have is who you are to your friends and your family and people that genuinely know you. And if you can get your users and your customer base to understand you that way, you will be money. People will love reading what you write. So I would start doing your first, you know, if you want to do your first five blog posts, start out as a four minute tape record and you're going to feel kind of nutty doing it, but it really does help. And this is just the broadcast journalist in me, but it really does help to find your voice if you say it as if you were saying it to your best friend. Or better yet, have someone sit next to you. Like, I'm going to do, a, let's say you're a restaurant reviewer. I'm going to do this restaurant review. I'm going to tell you right now as I would tell my best friend and the blog post should sound like that. So if that's helpful. Anyone else? No? Okay. Well, thank you guys so much. I hope it was helpful.